Welcome to the Sleeping Barber Podcast. I'm glad you could join us for this deep dive into Kantar's work on brand equity with Mary Kiriakidi. And feel free to stick around for the post-pod discussion with V and Mark. Welcome to the Sleeping Barber Podcast, a place for business leaders to get the best and most credible information on marketing, strategy, and innovation. Your hosts, Mark Binkley and Vasilis Duros, share their experiences as they gather insights from the world's leading experts. Now, on with the show. Welcome to the show. Today, I have Mary Kiriakidi. Oh, did I get that? Is that you right? did. You did, Mark. Thank you for inviting me. Awesome. Thanks for being here. So, Mary, I'm going to do a quick bio, and, and I'm really excited about this conversation. So, currently, you're the global thought leader uh, at Kantar, or a global thought leader at Kantar, specifically, mm-hmm. I think, on brand. Is that fair to say? It is, yes. Brand equity. Yes. Uh, formerly a VD, uh, a VP of business development and brand insight there. And you've also had a master, got a master's in gender and media from the London School of Economics and Poli Sci. Mm-hmm. Welcome to the show. It's nice to be here, Mark. Awesome. Hey, before we, oh, I mean, this is really a question. It's not before we get into the main question. This is the question. The, yeah. I'm super interested in what you've done with your master's in gender and media. Can you maybe tell me a bit about that? Right. Yeah. Well, I, well, I can tell you it was 20 years ago, which is, um, shocking. Um, but you're right. Um, you know, it's, it's not the most common master's degree you can have in media. And, um, and I know that when I was looking for my first job in the UK, everyone uh, at interviews were asking me, but why? Why gender in the media as opposed to mm-hmm. media and communications, for instance? You know, and I, I think I think it might have to do with the environment I grew up in, you know, the Greece of the 80s and 90s. And um, it wasn't it wasn't that women were less likely than men to be represented in media, at least at least that's how I I saw it as a young teenager. It, w- it was more like those perilous gender representations, again, as I perceived them, um, in mm-hmm. advertising, in the morning talk shows, and, and God, we had many, and still have, um, in news bulletins. And these were potentially reinforcing uh, harmful gender stereotypes. So mm-hmm. gender stereotypes that I had personally learned to accept so I, you know, mm-hmm. I thought that was it. This is as far as we can stretch it. Uh, and you know, mm-hmm. your your dreams are defined accordingly, and you you aspire to what you see and to what your kaleidoscope of memories has been, to what you've mm-hmm. been taught. But then you you go ahead and you evolve and and you start questioning things, and and this is how gender in the media, I suppose, it came about. Hmm. And like, is there? From where you were growing up in Greece to where we are today, do you see those roles changing? Uh, um, well, we've moved along, right? Undeniably, we have. Uh, but but it's a strange world the world we live in because, you know, on the on the one hand, you see those um, traditional gender stereotypes being challenged. Yes, and and I'm thinking of the PNG campaign, for instance, you know, the, the, the do things like a girl and I get chills. Mm-hmm. It's very powerful um, to change that common insult, the like a girl one for the, um, to, to, to a declaration of something that is downright amazing is, is quite a big deal. But then on the other hand, you know, on social media, for instance, we see new pressures seem to be perpetually um um, sorry, seem to be um, perpetuating antiquated gender stereotypes, and I'm referring here mm-hmm. to female uh, Instagramming, for instance, for instance, where right. you know, their whole life seems to be resembling a commercial from from the fifties. It's it's strange, right? It's mm-hmm. bizarre. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, but as as I as I've said, we've we've moved along undeniably. Yeah. So there's, in a way, there's more variety, but you still see some of that old stuff hanging around. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Well, I mean, as a global thought leader, uh, I mean, I'm sure media, uh, sorry, social roles play a a role in branding. And I'm sure there's something you think about when you look at brands overall. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm just switching gears now that like you've written so many amazing articles about. Oh, thank you. 
branding and brand equity and what it means and how you measure it. And Kantar itself has been involved in all kinds of frameworks um, in, in sort of establishing, you know, what is a brand and, and how you can measure yeah. the importance of uh, brand impact on things like financial performance. So um, I want to get into a whole mm -hmm. bunch of that um, with you. And then just kind of teeing it up a little bit, like Kantar, sorry, the, the COVID period mm -hmm. has been really interesting for brands, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, where when first it happened, everyone was like, oh, we're all in this together. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so there's like an evolution now where it feels like there's a bit of a rebound away from that now. And everyone's kind of just refocusing on brand. And, um, and, and so there's changes in consumer behavior as well, because we have these lockdowns and then things are opening up and then they lock down again. Yeah. And so there's a whole bunch of like challenges that brands are having to like resolve in. Um, one of the articles you wrote, The Art of Brand Strategy, um, it reminds us about the unchanging nature of customers. And I think what's interesting about that is that even despite all these other things that are happening in the world, lockdown and mobility challenges of people, um, there is this unchanging nature of brands. And, and you mentioned that she's the customer. She's polygamous towards brands. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a bit more about that and... and Sure. Why it's important for marketers to really understand that kind of idea? Yes, yes, I know I can. Um, there is um, there's a quote from um, Sarah Carter um, from Adam and Eve uh, DDB, so that I like very much actually. Um, and it's um, she, she talks about how planners should have post-it notes on their desk saying consumers really couldn't care less or, or maybe she says mm -hmm. it a little bit more rudely so people are indifferent to brands and and advertising and and that should be a planner's starting point to do a good job so this is what she says and 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 this is the reality i mean the consumer is a, a serial adulterer oh yeah he <laughs> uh, she shops around you know and mm -hmm. it's for that reason really that uh, over the last 10 years or so we've seen a shift you know companies have been increasingly investing in activation in targeting in the in the in the short term of things right incentivating mm -hmm. buyers in their category because they want to catch them while mm -hmm. they're well, they're out there shopping um mm -hmm. now that's you know that's that's one thing uh, to put there on the table but you see our analysis at Kantar finds that two thirds of a brand's growth comes from people who are already predisposed to choose a specific brand. So in mm -hmm. other words, just to be recognizable does not necessarily mm -hmm. mean that you're going to get picked uh, often mm -hmm. again. Uh, you see, so in um, it's the power of brand equity that is revealed in people's choice. And this mm -hmm. is often the tipping point between a brand and its competitors. So, yes, they do shop around. Absolutely, they do. But it all starts with that power in the mind of the consumer, which is their predisposition towards a brand. So it's an interesting idea. And I just before I want to ask about predisposition, but just going back to that, um, the consumer is an adult <laughs> I love yeah. that idea. But I mean, it's a totally different thought than consumers are loyal. I mean, they're the exact opposite, but, and yet there's so much about what we talk about in marketing or historically have talked about in marketing where it's all about loyalty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, uh, you see, there's, people are referring to this as, as, as a leaky bucket or a pipe work right. uh, that has uh, weak connections. And the reality mm -hmm. is that the less you lose, the more you will be able to gain from penetration from a greater reach anyway. So you've got mm -hmm. to work about, you need to understand uh, how, where you're losing people, what is your right. connection, because ultimately what you want to do is you want, you want to make sure that your brand is easy to bring to mind and easy to buy. Um, mm -hmm. So, so, um, Yes, we want a predisposed consumer because there are many benefits that are coming mm -hmm. to this. But you need to make sure that you, you know, you, the ones that you you have, you you've kept relatively happy. So experience matters, mm -hmm. uh, obviously. Yeah. And so you know, in that idea of predisposition, um, 
maybe talk to me about a little bit about what you mean by predisposition. I think I have an understanding, but I just, if you don't mind just clarifying that, that'd be good. So, predisposition is exactly that. So it's the, it's, it's the, uh, it's the place where, um, you know, if, if your brand uh, is easy to bring to mind and if your brand is easy to buy, then you've, you've actually achieved it in a sense that, you know, you've, you've made your life as a marketer very easy or easier, let's mm-hmm. put it like that. So um, so these people who are predisposed, uh, positively predisposed, predisposed towards your brand, you know, they they uh they need less stroking let's be like they they um mm-hmm. they need to be reminded less or uh, they don't need to be reminded as much or you know mm-hmm. they can go the extra mile for you in a sense that there will be market obstacles at some point that it might be that the delivery dates are, are um not very convenient or it might be that you're out of stock they can't find you they will find a way to overcome them they are also willing to pay more very importantly you know those those predisposed consumers um want, we are willing to pay more and and spontaneously do your word of mouth for you word of mouth for you so they um mm-hmm. they are um Although re- restricted in a sense that you know they they speak to a small it doesn't have the reach they speak to a small number of people um, and to people who have common interests as them um, they, the word of mouth part yeah yes yes they do yeah. they still uh, they still do this job for you and and they are less distracted by competitive ad- advertising so they're they're a very valuable group it's a predisposition is a, it's a very valuable um, um, notion. Um, mm-hmm. So it's 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 linked to brand equity. So it's all about brand equity, which is mm-hmm. the core element of a brand's strength. Mm-hmm. And, and brand equity, um, I mean, it, it, it's one of those challenging ones for me in, in that um, so many I've seen a lot of different definitions of what brand equity is and, and how you measure it. And you've actually written a bunch of articles and I'll, I'll put a bunch of the links uh, to the articles well, that you. you've written here. Uh, in the notes, but can you give me a sense of where, how you guys at Cantar and how yourself thinks about brand equity and like, yeah. just concrete, like simply what it is, what does it mean? And then what, what kinds of things can you do um, to help improve that? Yes, yes, no, I can't, I can't. And I can tell you this because we've been doing this work for the last 15 years. So, um, with uh, via Cantar Branzi, so we've been celebrate. I wasn't there, right? I, I'm I'm more mm-hmm. than the company, but uh, we've been celebrating uh, the more uh, the most powerful and valuable brands in the world uh, for the last fifteen years, and and. Uh, so that means that we've measured more than twenty thousand brands. You know, it's a big number. We've had uh, conversations, as in interviews with consumers, more than four million in over fifty mm-hmm. markets. So, um, apart from generating the list, you know, and by the list I mean eff- effectively that you know the one hundred mm-hmm. most valuable brands every year. What we're trying mm-hmm. to determine is how these brands have managed to achieve growth. Because right. you know, growth is, is is quite an intriguing topic in a sense that in an ordinary year, only six percent of businesses achieve it. Is it because they get lucky? Uh, not yeah. really. I mean, good fortune has nothing to do with it. Uh, they they are the ones who have built powerful associations. Uh, they are the ones mm-hmm. who have altered, if they had to, the uh, the consumers' perceptions, and 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 they used let's say, media in a winning way to drive effectiveness. So mm-hmm. <clears throat> so for us, um, a brand's equity in, in the minds of the consumers is a game-changing multiplier in the calculation of a brand's value. So you see all mm-hmm. these financial evaluations that are there about brands, we, we do it a little bit differently because we bring in uh, we bring we bring in the the brand equity as well. So we um, we always include brand equity in 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 a brand's financial evaluation, and and this is what mm-hmm. sets um, brands apart because it shows the future contribution that investment in the brand is making. Um, mm-hmm. you, there are many there are many benefits. I mean, the the stronger your brand is, the faster you grow. 
uh, the better, let's say, you navigate through market storms like the last couple of years that we've had mm -hmm. or category or new category arrivals. And there, there are always many. Um, the, uh, the more valuable effectively it is. Mm -hmm. So that, that's... The more um, resilient. Right? Correct, uh, correct, yeah. correct. Um, and I think it was a piece that, I mean, or a series of pieces that had to be written, <laughs> right? There were there were many questions from from clients as well, uh, from clients. So we, um, I mean, I'll, and I'll be honest, we've, um, you know, it's it's a very frequently searched term as well. So we mm -hmm. realized that people had a lot of questions around it, mm -hmm. um, and um, and we never, you know, you know how I mentioned with uh, for the last fifteen years, effectively, we've been trying to demystify brand equity and and mm -hmm. and how to grow it we still do it i mean it doesn't end you know there's uh, there's r&d that is happening it's continued mm -hmm. we keep on having conversation with the clients um the more more truths are coming out mm -hmm. more routes to better brand equity are jumping out of the work that we're doing either with clients or and or uh from our ongoing analysis and and our passion mm -hmm. learning um yeah, it's an interesting thing. I mean, the Brand Z um, report, let's call it, it, is is like a staple. It's a really interesting report, and and I know there's a significant part of that, and, and inherent with I think probably brand equity, the term itself, is there's a financial component yeah. beyond just like an awareness element, right? And so it's combined. Is it combining those two things uh, in this right. es essence, <laughs> trying to predict? Yeah. yeah or decode the, the elements of growth? Yes, exactly, exactly. Decoding, deconstructing it, this is, this is what we do, yeah. Hmm. Um, in, in what ways can brands um, track their equity? Right, so, so the question you're asking is um, how, we, how we figure out effectively and keep on monitoring how yeah. much our brand like contributes to our uh, enterprise value right this yeah, is like the the core elements and i know it's an evolutionary thing by the sounds of what you're saying is that yeah so every we, year you guys do this it sounds like the model kind of gets refined and is improved upon yes um yes um we've got um we do this via brand power so it's a it's a validated metric uh that metric of brand power and um it's it's what I would describe as a, a as a, as a surrogate for understanding and quantifying long term sales. We're talking about the long term. Mm -hmm. so, so so what's within it is a comprehensive set of brand equity metrics, and and these metrics, what they do is they they help you explain and predict uh, a brand market reality. So it does mm -hmm. all the heavy lifting really because what. Um, what brand power does um, is that very difficult job of closing the gap between perception and reality. Um, mm -hmm. And you probably, I mean, I um, I refer to it as a as a secret sauce. Uh, so I refer to it as a secret sauce um, that we use for brand power. But it's, we're not secret about it. It's quite the opposite, <laughs> actually. Uh, here I am talking about it, but. Um, we talk about brands being meaningful and different and salient, right? So those mm -hmm. three things to get together. And this is what we argue is, um, you know, the combination of these three, we argue that is greater than simply just the addition of them. Um, mm -hmm. Because they give, you, they give you a lot, you know, they... Um, um, you, you can... If, if, if a brand manages to be meaningful and different and salient you know those brands have the power to do all these things that we talked about before to to capture um significantly uh, more volume to command uh, a better premium so people are willing to pay more and have mm -hmm. um the greater potential to to gain mm -hmm. share in the future in the long term mm -hmm. i'm i'm just looking at um and i'll put a link to the uh, meaningful different framework if, mm -hmm. if you don't mind into the show notes as oh, well yes, but, please, yeah. um i know that so i'm just looking at that and is that sort of the the model like i've seen meaningful different and salient on here 
which is our contributors to that brand disposition Correct. that we yes. talked about before. Yes. Um, yes. And that, that ultimately drives that, that, power premium and potential of the of the brand correct correct that, am so i reading that right you're reading this right yes okay and and so um what are like how for for large organizations um that would want to work with Cantar? i'm sure that would be like something that you guys would offer for people and helping measure that um sort of those elements mm-hmm. um can can like the regular brand anywhere in Canada, let's say, or in the US, is there, are, can they measure these things like meaningful being different yeah. and being salient? Yes, yes, um, they can They can measure these things and they can uh, bench, benchmark themselves against their category. And, you know, depending on their size, I suppose, uh, against their direct competitors, but um, it's, um, it's it's about who you're bringing into the to to the study and whether consumers can then answer these questions. It's about the mm-hmm. scope sizes and all that, right? Mm-hmm. But but yes, the world is in the work the work is international, um, mm-hmm. and it's covering all sectors uh, and mm-hmm. uh, and uh, many many countries. Yeah, I, I I suppose like it would be hard to measure any of those kinds of things, e- even if you're in any size of company without doing market research. Is that fair to say? Or oh, yes. Customer really. research? Yes, absolutely. You need to do market research. Yeah. yeah. I know that sounds obvious, but yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Like that, that would be the, like, it's not like Google's going to give you the answer or Facebook's going to oh, give no, you the no, answer. No, no. For some, yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. Uh, it's not. It, it'll give you many other answers. Not this one. Yeah. Which leads me to uh, one of the things that in your, one of the papers that you wrote about insights before strategy, I just thought that was such an interesting point um, because if we're talking about making improvements in brand equity and, it, and, and it, it, I, the way I kind of understand this is that um, it's a bit about diagnosis. Yeah. Is that, is that fair? Or like maybe you can talk about the insights before strategy statement and, and specifically why that order even matters. Yeah, um, and I think um, I'm I'm gonna you know you mentioned it before. My background is in is in research, right? So uh, Brian mm-hmm. is right for broadcast media, traditional broadcast media, and um, so for many years I, I actually felt that as a team we were tasked to prove um, what had already been decided. So so mm-hmm. yes, we were asking the consumers, and yes, we were interested in what they had to say. But the creative minds had already decided about the direction we would be taking, and um, I just find this very ironic. I, mean, I always did, because why on earth would you do market orientation if you already know, you know, what you're doing? Uh, mm-hmm. di- diagnosis should come before strategy, because it's almost like asking your brand, uh, "What's really wrong with you?" You know, if you if you ask mm-hmm. nicely, it will tell you. Uh, if you've already decided what's wrong and and you've fabricated mm-hmm. your diagnosis um, and you've decided on what type of surgery, let's say, you will perform on your brand, then there's mm-hmm. no point asking. Um, and uh, in this, I think it's in, in this article that I mentioned, I mentioned exa- a couple of examples from the industry, um, you know, the way on Marketing Week, um, the KFC and uh, the National Lottery, they they addressed a sales dip, not by rushing to advertising, which is normally the default uh, answer mm-hmm. that we're, um, we have to fix stuff, uh, but by performing rigorous diagnostics first. So, you mm-hmm. know, they got to the source of the problem before they committed to fixing it. Um, mm-hmm. And it, it's, it's like, um, you know, Mark Ritson, um his first axiom, in his uh, relatively, I mean, it's not uh, recent, but it's a year ago, I think, brand strategy article on marketing week. So he 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 talk he talks about the first step in any decent mm-hmm. brand strategy being the step backwards, and he then goes on to say um, uh, the, the step entails, you know, getting a brand tracker, a proper one. Um, mm-hmm. So yes, and I and I've also been on the course as well. Um, so I'm a, a yeah. 
mini MBA uh, marketing alumni. And if there's anything that stays with you uh, from the course, and but there are more things, it's that diagnosis totally, coming yeah. before strategy. Yeah. Yeah, that was an epiphany for me too when he, like, I, I, we both took that course, but I mean, yeah, it was an epiphany where, I mean, it sounds so obvious when you say it yeah. first, but like. Why on earth? Yeah, how can we? Yeah. Yeah. Been doing it this yeah. way all along. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's such an uh, instant reaction for marketers in that oftentimes I find marketers are often just advertisers. And so they approach every problem as though it's an ad problem, but in reality, it might be something entirely different. Ads might be helpful Correct. later yeah. as a prescription, but they're not necessarily going to solve the problem. Yeah. 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 No. <laughs> so it, when you guys are doing this kind of work um, with Kantar and, and clients of yours, is it the marketers that you're working with or is it other people within the business as well? Like in um, terms of doing the research and, and, and finding out the insights? Marketers, but more so the, the research teams. Um, but, but often they come to us together. Um, uh, right. if, if there are no silos in the company, then yes, they are. Um, right. They are together in this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, there, so, and the diagnosing of, pro I, for a long time, I wanted to be a, a doctor and then I found I didn't really like <laughs> the medical profession as, as a whole, but, uh, um, but, but I, I, I studied science and I, and so for like, I just, for me, I love this stuff because it makes so much sense, the logical approach to it. And, and so the diagnosis part, it, it can be a very, in some ways, binary, assuming you have all the right inputs and you have all the right ideas uh, or all the data coming in mm -hmm. and you've interpreted it correctly. It's a very precise sort of methodical, um, logical process. Correct. But then Correct. you get into the strategic uh, solutions for it. Um, and, and in some ways, I think the strategy can be incredibly creative, uh, mm -hmm. which isn't necessarily like in terms of like, we make nice pictures, but um, just the choices that you're making and how you resolve problems can be really creative. Mm. And I know when uh, Kantar published uh, some new work, I think it's called Insights 2030. Yes. Um, stressing the importance of imagination. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and like why, why that paper to begin with and what does it mean? <laughs> what is it? And like, um, what's it yeah. all about? Okay, well, this is the phenomenal work. Um, it's it's the Kantar Consulting uh, Division. Uh, they've they've undertaken this. Um, I mean, they always do clever stuff. They are a team of very bright people. Um, so over the last eighteen months, um, Jay Walker Smith and his team they've been interviewing you know a thousand business uh, and insights leaders worldwide. Okay, about. Mm -hmm what it is that differentiates leading leading companies and their uh, insights organizations from from those that are lagging behind this is what they wanted to understand and and also to find out what it is that senior mm -hmm. business leaders really want from insight so mm -hmm. so in a nutshell uh what they want is imagination you know they want insights to spark a more expansive way of thinking uh, and mm -hmm. engaging um so uh, Walker is more poetic when he talks about it, and 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 he puts it in. I, I want to say it as he says. So it's it's like um, it's it's a deeper, more expansive, more compassionate understanding of the journey of life, rather than mm -hmm. just the journey to the store. Um, I love this. Mm -hmm. um, so 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 the role of insights effectively is not just to connect the dots. It's it's a it's a richer vision uh, beyond those dots, um, mm. uh, and uh, and they've done um, you know they've, they've done their call, uh, the thousands of interviews and uh, real evidence was there to support uh, uh, to support this argument. So they, they they've also grouped companies that have embraced uh, a commitment to um, consumer centricity or to imagination. Mm -hmm. And then to both, so they had those three groups, and and among companies focused first on consumer centricity, um, sixty eight percent outperformed the marketplace, but mm -hmm. imagination 
is more powerful. And more powerful mm. still is a high level of both. So high imagination and high customer centricity with, um, with I think, it was 87% of those companies overperforming the marketplace. Mm. So um, it, it's, it's quite important um, uh, to work as a combination with um, um, customer centricity as well. It's interesting because I, I um, and I, I want to ask about a couple examples specifically, but when I hear things like that, I sometimes I can picture various scenarios where uh, places where I've worked in the past and, and mm-hmm. there's people who uh, they say, okay, we, we need to be more customer centric. And then they just instantly go in kind of defensive mode and go, no, no, no we, we're, we're totally customer centric. And, you know, here's an example, here's an example, here's an example. Or you mm. go, we need to be more imaginative. Go, no, we're totally imaginative. Like we've got this and this and this. It's almost like people see whatever they see, what they want out of stuff like this. So, like, mm. how would you? How do you know? Or and maybe like some examples of companies. But how do you know if you're really imaginative? And how do you know if you're really customer centric and not just, you know, defending yourselves as as being those things? Um. You know, moving moving from I suppose one way to measure it is that if you if you can if you can manage to move from consumers to humans, from data mm-hmm. to change, from analytics to mm-hmm. activation, um, so with a what what we would say is like a corresponding shift from from the what to the why, because right. um, you know, I, and you, to your to your question about the example, I think we've. Um, I think we've all heard about. I'm going to use. Um, I'm going to use uh, Amazon as an example because the, they've been. Um, you know, they maintained their position as the world's most valuable brand in our Cantar Brandy list. You know, the, mm-hmm. the top 100 uh, Cantar Brandy most valuable brands, and um, they're a very good example. So we, I think we, they took they tick both boxes. Um, the customer centricity one in a sense that we i think we all know the empty chair uh thing so they drag it into every meeting and oh yeah they, that's a great story they uh they, in theory the consumer is participating in every conversation so his her opinion matters probably more than everyone else's but mm-hmm. but there's there's also something more um than the empty chair there's 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 also the two pizza team rule that they have mm-hmm. Which which practically means that any team should be small enough that it could be fed with two pizzas. So, with mm-hmm. the reason being that the more people you bring into the team, the more blocked uh, their imagination could be, hence the less uh, productive their meetings would likely be. Uh, although, mm-hmm. you know, I, I I would argue I can eat a pizza on my own, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure about the, <laughs> yeah, the like number of those Two pieces. people, one person yes, per piece. Two people, yeah, two people seeing the network. I guess it depends on the day. Yeah, I would probably yeah. do the same thing. I might even go with two. Um, yes. Yes. The the Amazon's example of like bringing in a chair to represent, an empty chair to represent mm. the customer. I think it's such an interesting idea. Like that is so tangible. And same with the two pizza rule. It's so tangible. But it yeah. rep like the the representation of a customer as an empty chair is really interesting because it forces you to think outside of probably the spreadsheets right in front of you and imagine and be empathetic, yes, uh, to the customer and and sort of trying to put yourself in their shoes in a way like in a very mm-hmm. visual, deliberate way. It's so it's such an I interesting agree. example. Yes. Um. So the other thing that one of my former bosses used to say, though, I mean, there's strategy in everything. So we've got this piece about insights and we've got this piece about strategy and, and the importance of creativity. And and so thinking back to this boss that I had, you know, he would say like, yeah, literally there's strategy in everything. Like there's strategy in, in, in the creative, there's strategy in the targeting, there's strategy in the media buy, there's strategy. In, you know, it's not just the strategy that's the, the company strategy. Yeah. Um, yeah. When when you talk about brand strategy, do you mean like all those pieces, or is it something bigger? Like, or is it, is it one overarching strategy? 
Um, yes, it's one of our archer one. So I'll, t- I, um, I'll tell you something. So I, I, I used to be, I used to be an avid fan of the Apprentice show. So stay oh, with okay. me because yeah. I'm, I'm going yeah. somewhere. Okay. <laughs> so every, every single time um, when um, they, they were going into the boardroom, there was finger pointing, obviously, uh, that was happening mm-hmm. and, and about who's going to get found. And, and, and the blame was always of the same nature, you know, but there was no strategy, you know, one would mm-hmm. say. Uh, and it was never, but your strategy has failed. It was always the absence of strategy that was being brought up. So, um, mm-hmm. and it was um, ultimately the reason, the absence of strategy was the reason why they didn't know what to do and they were running around like headless chickens. So there is, um, there is a, there's a quote from um, Jeremy uh, Pullmore uh, that I think explains the whole thing. Uh, he talks about people building brands as birds mm-hmm building nests from scraps and straws which are which chance upon and now he's referring to consumers who construct their perceptions of brands from their own experiences you know the moments they have the trials you know the experience brand, the ads they uh, they receive the so it answers everything all the cues that brand owners are giving to them but you see brand owners mm. themselves um, cannot cannot lead this to chance you know, their their the brand building needs to have that discipline. It needs a framework that provides focus at every stage of the journey, from mm-hmm. defining and um, then refining, potentially resetting the brand strategy, t- to then guiding effective um, development and you know ensuring that the the implementation is right as well. So, yes, when mm-hmm. we're talking about brand strategy, our advice to brand owners is to ensure that their brand essence consistently permeates and, and connects everything they do from the beginning to the end. The, the, the visual in my head, as you were describing that build brands as bird nests, uh, as brands, <laughs> sorry, as birds build nests is really interesting in in that, the like I imagine like a bird with a little I don't know, all yeah. the little pieces of straw and sticks and that kind of stuff. I, I, so all those different elements that we talked about before, like the creative or the mm-hmm. products that the company has to offer, or um, probably their distribution centers and like their storefronts and all those different mm-hmm. things. Yeah, Those are like the little pieces of the nest that the bird is using to build their nest. Is that Correct. fair to yeah. say? These are these are the cues. The consumer is is, receive, is receiving cues from every single thing that you mentioned. Um, everyone plays a role, and uh, and everything creates then the idea that you have an association you you feel you have with the brand. Hmm. So in a way, I'm I'm going to go in the deep end here for a second, but in a way, it's kind of like the brand strategist then is almost saying like, here's the nest we're going to build. Here's an ex- we need all these elements. We need you guys or girls to help bring your pieces together because this mm-hmm. is kind of the uh, the architecture of the the designs of the yeah. nest. Yeah, yeah. You can you you can see it like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if it's right, but okay. Let's go. Let's go with it. It's uh, it's an interesting idea. Like it's a really I never heard that example. It's a really interesting idea. And um, so as, as some of the elements of building this brand strategy out, I mean, you and I both, uh, we've talked about that course that Mark Ritson has, which is great. One of the elements that he uses in that is the three C's. So the customer, competitors, and company. And it, I, mm-hmm. I feel like that's such a great pillar of building out like a positioning uh, and, yeah. and, it, and a bit of a diagnosis too, I think, um, for a company who's trying to f- understand what is important to the customer, um, mm-hmm. what's defendable against the competition and what's unique to them. True. And so somewhere in there probably is those elements of distinctiveness and, and differentiation. Um, yeah. Can so you the, talk yeah. about that. Yeah. The, the, the three C's, I suppose they stand for different things, but it, it, for me, it could, it could even be common sense. Right. Um, mm. but, uh, 
but you see that common sense is not necessarily very easy to do every every single time. So, it's, um, part of a marketer's job is is to create that priming mechanism to to build mm-hmm. those memories that help a brand to be chosen in that purchasing situation we talked about. So, mm-hmm. these three um, simple questions, as in who is it for thinking about your consumer and can mm-hmm. we actually do it as a company? Can the brand itself do it? And, and, and the why uh, our, um, our brand, our product or service is, is different or better to uh, our competitors. These are the, these three um, C questions, I suppose, that mm-hmm. um, sometimes, um, although they are very important, they are being overlooked. Mm-hmm. And we were talking about strategy in, in that example you brought up of the of the apprentice where people are blaming everyone saying, oh, there is no strategy. Is that how often do you see that? I mean, there's so many different elements that I've seen uh, out there in terms of research that says there's strategy is kind of missing. And yes. often people confuse it with goals. Is that is that common from your point of view or? Yeah, I think it's 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 very common to um, to confuse strategy with um, you know uh, the objective uh, that you've got, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, I think there was um, there was a it, it's in it's in one of my articles, and now now I'm going to butcher it. I might be it's as if I I didn't write it, but it, um, <laughs> it's, it's Scott uh, Galloway. I mean, he didn't. He said, "What did he say? Uh, there is uh, there are too many strategies and uh, no strategy happening. Something like that." And um, uh, sorry, I think you just cut out. Can you just say that again? I... Uh, there are too many strategists, but uh, not not enough strategy happening. Oh, okay. Uh, or none, effectively. And mm-hmm. um, you can see the people, um, although there's no. Um, haha button on LinkedIn you can see the emojis coming in and I and I think people find this funny but I, I think there is um, there's truth in in every funny statement and mm-hmm. I think you might have been more right than funny actually mm-hmm. and, and um, to have a competitive strategy I mean, like what is it's a, it is an interesting idea because there are lots of people that are strategists and and um, to have a competitive strategy for those people who who are looking at something that's, you know, our product is uh, has to be different or distinctive. I mean, that's a conversation I think is an interesting one too. Mm, do, yes. Do these yes. people who are who are making the choices on the strategy do they need to be different? Because I know that's an element in the Cantar model is differentiation. Yeah. Do you have to be different it's, it's, in order to ha- to have an effective strategy? Yeah, this is I think this is where we're starting to confuse people, right? Because as an as an industry, we've done a, an 180 on uh, on differentiation. You know, from the time we were we were talking about uh USP and then about mm-hmm. differentiate or die mantra, you know, 50 years ago. Mm-hmm. And, to, to, to today, effectively, where the Ehrenberg Bass Institute is questioning whether differentiation can even be achieved or whether differentiation is, in fact, necessary for a brand to be right. more valuable to consumers uh, to be successful. Now, <clears throat> we what we advocate, just to confuse people even more, so what we advocate at Kantar is that meaningful um, differentiation can be achieved and to those who do it gives an advantage and we don't you know we don't we don't say this because we take sides but because the data clearly points to this um so we've got proof uh we've got proof um Mm -hmm. i can tell you if you want um yeah i'd love to yeah so um 2021 uh, was a very funny year right so a year we uh, it was difficult for a for for consumers, it was difficult for brands, but not for all brands. You know, we've seen, mm-hmm. referring again to Cantar Brands, what we've seen is a record annual growth of 42% uh, in the mm-hmm. top 100 most valuable brands. That is 4.5 times the average growth rate since we started doing exactly that 15 years ago. 
So mm -hmm. if you think about it, it's a real life enigma. I mean, how could this happen in a year where so many have struggled? And then, <clears throat> and then you think about it again. And it's not. It's it's not really that um, uh, perplexed because growth is rarely hostage to the marketplace, and um, it was it was given. It was offered to to those companies that did the right thing. So these these companies that grew uh, in a year like the one. Uh, we've had the walls into the pandemic with with a clear brand equity advantage. Their mm -hmm. proposition was strong. That reciprocal relationship with the consumer was there. They simply had more than just you know high profile and fame. Um, they weren't just known. So so in in the terms that I used before, um, those brands were perceived to offer a meaningful difference far in excess of uh, their salience so they were um, they were perceived um, by consumers as meaningful difference and meaningful meaningfully different um, and 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 a year before that so in 2020 um, we we've done an academic study with um, Oxford University Said business School mm -hmm. so uh, we wanted to understand the precise contribution that marketing activities make to what's known as abnormal financial returns so these are mm -hmm. the financial returns that are derived um when when a company's stock performs better than the market mm -hmm. expected now they use they use uh, kantar brands database and uh they they studied uh, almost 900 brands and their their expected financial returns over a period of 12 years um and then mm -hmm. and then what they did they um they furnish them with thousands and thousands of brand equity observation points. Now, fast forward to the very end, when we got the results, they created a, that model and um, they, they sifted through the, the possible variables um, mm -hmm. and reducing them to, to those brand factors that contribute most to those mm -hmm. abnormal business returns. And you know what? Difference was in there. Difference was in there as one of... of, of of those as one of those factors uh, it's been identified as a key driver of a strong and valuable brand so in, in fact it was revealed difference was revealed to be um you know the biggest contributor towards abnormal stock returns um this is what uh we found uh back in 2020 with um hmm. with the, the said business school hmm. so um so for and that was for ab abnormal growth brands, I think is what you, mm -hmm. how you phrase it, right? So there's so there's an idea maybe that you can be competitive by being distinctive, but you get outsized performance by being unique or different. You're right. You're absolutely right. Is that fair? Uh, that's it. Yes. So um, you are. You need to. You need to. What we would argue is that you need to go beyond distinctiveness. So um, yes, mm -hmm. brands um, are distinct. You know, through associations with uh, unique brand assets like designs, advertising properties, sponsorships, or everything that's being used. But so, so distinctiveness. Yes, absolutely helps a brand grow, but we can do better. So. Anything that aids mental and physical availability, so the easy to mind, mm -hmm. the easy to find we were talking about before, mm -hmm. is, is valuable in marketing, in marketing a brand. I mean, so um, so difference through positive associations, though, does more than just build or maintain the presence of a brand. It justifies paying more for it, and you know, mm -hmm. the growing your margin will typically have a much better impact on company performance than just increasing volume. So mm -hmm. so the this is where this is where the role of the marketer comes in because you know if you can just do a little bit better than your competitor, not mm -hmm. not in owning a world, because you know you do that one day and then the next day it gets copied. But in combining different worlds, in in rigorously then executing them, this is how the predisposition nudges kick in and somehow mm. your brand gets chosen versus another one in a purchasing situation. 
Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I'm just, uh, this is really interesting. There, there's, um, I, I had interviewed Jenny Romanic um, a while mm-hmm. back. And so she, we were talking about the distinctiveness versus differentiation conversation. Mm-hmm. And as you're saying this, I'm just replaying some of the sound bites in my head that I, uh, that's from her. And so differentiation is really interesting because it's almost like you're trying to steal from a Warren Buffett quote. It's like your competitive moat. Um, and so being able to defend that uniqueness uh, mm-hmm. over a period of time is, I imagine, really challenging for some of these brands um, or for any brand. Because yeah. then eventually people see what you're doing and they want to try and copy it. Correct. Correct. So different. So when we're talking about difference, you know, a different brand is the one that is being perceived as a trendsetter for its category, effectively, as unique, we say. So um, um, it, it, it can it, being different can take a number of forms, right? It, it could be just I mean, it's not just really, but um, simply being better. Uh, are delivering uh, core needs, core needs of a category versus other brands. This is we're always talking about the competition. So, for mm-hmm. instance, innovation uh, will help you deliver these results, but we know it will give you a small window. Um, mm-hmm. you, or you can try to meet additional needs that than other brands um, do. So, go beyond and um go go beyond than just meet the functional needs um you know this is this is what um it's 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 this emotionally um this is what makes it emotionally appealing to consumers effectively so um mm-hmm. differentiation can it's not it's not it's not easy uh it's not very easy but uh differentiation can be achieved and as i said before mm-hmm. to those who who do achieve it? It gives an advantage, and it's and it's the role of the marketer to to take it a step further. Hmm. Yeah. There, there's and the other idea um, that popped in my head as you were saying that is there's a story about the second half of the chessboard. I don't know if you ever heard of that story. No, say more. So it, it the story is that um, I'm going to butcher the story, but there's a a, a guy way back when who was hired by king to come or or the king put up a like an rfp saying hey we want a new game and Mm -hmm. so this this uh king said you know the winner of the new game is going to get untold riches so all these game makers apply for this rfp and they're like okay well we're gonna do this everyone comes up and presents their uh their games and this one guy uh, presented the king this game called chess. And so mm-hmm. they explained the chess board and uh, explained the pieces and how they move. And the king really liked it. And the king's court loved it. And so the guy's like, okay, well, the king says, well, what can we pay you? And he's like, well, it's a really simple thing. I mean, there's 64 squares on the board. For the first square, since he loved it so much, I'll just take a grain of rice. For the second square, double it. For the third square, double that. And mm-hmm. so by the time it gets to the 64 square, the and the king's like, yeah, that's great. That's no problem. And so then the king says to his supply chain, he's like, go get all the grains of rice that we have that we need to pay this guy for this game. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So then the, the uh, supply chain guy goes, hey, okay, so I went into the supply store and found that um, in order for us to deliver all this rice, we're going to need a mountain the size of Mount Everest to pay this guy, right? right? And it's going to completely kill our organization. Um, And so the story there is that, you know, the first half of this uh, game, it's, you know, it doesn't sound like a lot, but by the time you get to the second half of the chessboard, the piles of rice start adding up Mm -hmm. and becoming Mm -hmm. multipliers. And so the way I think about differentiation in some ways is similar in that, if you can maintain and build an organization out of differentiation, by the time you get to the second half of the chessboard, it may not be clearly clear how much impact it will have in the short term, but in the long term, mm-hmm. it can pay off in abnormally large returns. Yes. Yes. No, I like that actually. I like that very much. Yeah. And and so the 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 
differentiation that you were talking about and it comes in different forms. Mm-hmm. I find, yes. I think it like it, it doesn't have to be that like our product is completely unique from everything else in the planet. But it can be the way that you're saying, like delivering it differently and and looking at the function, not just the functional benefits, but the Mm -hmm. emotional benefits and all these sort of small things which appear to be small now can be differentiated and quite lucrative in the long run. Correct. Every single one of those things are adding one more trace of differentiation in the eyes of the consumers. Yes. Hmm. Um, So... So what are the right ways to measure effectiveness of a brand strategy then? I mean, aside from just having it and not just having strategists, that's probably one right. good one. <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah. I'm, one, I'm one of those people who don't believe that marketing ROI, because I know there's a, there's a heated discussion out there. Um, I, don't, I don't believe it's stupid, um, but I just, I just think that it's not very clever on its own. Um, and I think I agree with you on this, <laughs> actually. Um, so, th- so I think it's because of the bits that we cannot measure very well or easily. So I'm referring, you know, to the to the long term of things. So the the, the brand marketing um, uh, that uh, the, because we can't measure that very well or that easily, that puts more pressure. Um, on marketing ROI and more people are using it. So, so yes, we are in a little bit of a mess, I suppose, because the 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 idyllic way that um, Borden, you know, back in the sixties, he described the marketing manager as a as a head chef, marshalling mm-hmm. activities to advance short and long term interests of the firm. And, and this actually is not, you know, we all know it's not quite happening. And and um, I think more than anyone else, um, Les Binet and Peter Phil, they've repeatedly talked about the somewhat broken um, in marketing mm-hmm. today and, and our industry's obsession with short term. So, you know, those short term um, results. Um, and there are, you know, there are many reasons for this. Um, but... Um, but there is uh, an amalgam of uh, of short and long term indicators that can can guide uh, a brand all the way through to sustainable growth. Um, and mm-hmm. and a marketer can use the short term indicators. I think this is the bit we do very well to quantify and or even celebrate accomplishments. You know, in the boardroom, mm-hmm. but also crucially, the long term indicators to gain that very precious um, stakeholder buy in. You know, through the commercial alignment, this is what they want to see, and the and, and the ability to predict future outcomes. You know, not in a gimmicky way, but it, you know, in, mm-hmm. a, in a precise, as precise as possible way with um, simulators. So, so essentially, you know, there is this blend of indicators out there, um, and uh, the, this this blend allows the marketer to to nudge their brand's equity throughout a, a tracking journey. Um, and as you say, to measure the effectiveness of the brand strategy, and and very importantly, where necessarily intervene, right? And course correct, because this is, you know, essentially this is what um, they've got to do. Hmm. Yeah, the ROI part to me, um, the reason why I was agreeing with you is like I, I think it's so interesting in that, uh, and I literally had a conversation about this just yesterday. But so often we uh, want to see, put a dollar in, you get a dollar out or put a dollar in, you get four out or whatever the mm-hmm. ROAS target is. But then you mentioned things, companies like Amazon. And at the beginning, they're looking at this, put a dollar in and oh, mm-hmm. very little is coming out, like pennies are coming out. Yeah. And yeah. at the beginning, there would be no reason ever to create create a company like that if there if all you looked at was an immediate return on investment correct and and you were not patient enough um or not in the company anymore to to look yeah what what the result will, what the impact will be um a few years later yeah even, um, even those companies like blockbuster and Kodak and you know all those classic examples where they're looking at their revenue stream they go here's our current revenue stream from DVD rentals <laughs> why would we ever invest in digital like there's no money coming out and then all of a sudden fast forward a few years and like 
Oh yeah, that's why. Yeah, that's why it was it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because there's no ROI. Just because there's no ROI at the beginning doesn't mean there isn't going to be any at the end. Yeah. No. True. True. Um, Mary, what's the just to kind of wrap up a little bit? I know we got a, a time a hard stop here in a couple of minutes. So, what do you think are some of the really exciting opportunities for marketers this year? Uh, um, I don't. I don't know if it's a, a an exciting opportunity, or or it could just be my hope, really. But um, I, if I could wish for something, it would be mm-hmm. of, of simplification. Uh, so, you know, the a year where we come to a consensus about um, the things that we do in marketing. So I just, I just feel that you know the the modern marketer is confusing. You know, the more you read. Uh, the more people you follow in the field, the the more confused, bizarrely, you become. Um, mm-hmm. So, um, I mean, that's that's because we don't all say the same thing, right? Uh, so, mm-hmm. so yeah. If if um, it's a wish, it's more than a wish, right? But it could be right. also an too. Yeah, and, and yeah, I think that's such a good point. I mean, the simplification. Blah, blah, blah. I can't even speak. The simplification. It'd be nice if I could speak. I can say it either. Yes. Yeah, simplification is such a nice thing. In that you're right. It is. It can be confusing. I, I think some of the things we've talked about, which I find really interesting, is um, in that model, for example, uh, that we were talking about before. Um, different, salient, meaningful. Um, you know, leading to brand disposition. I mean, this some of this stuff is not um, radically different from how, you know, other models exist. But what mm-hmm. I like is that there's like data and research that support this. Oh, um, yes, yes. And, and, Tons of it. Which is great because it gives you something to, to, to like simplify all the chaos that's out there. And so that, that's an interesting... I, I love that that contribution that you guys have made, you and and Ken oh, have made. Thank you for saying that. And we don't stop, right? R and D continues; it's ongoing. Hmm. Um, how can people find out more about you and the work you're doing, and um, just in general, keep keep on in touch with what what's going on? Well, I'm on LinkedIn, and I have a very um, uncommon name, or rather surname, so I'm I'm very easy to find. That's where mm-hmm. you're going to find me. Yeah, and I'll put a link uh, there oh, um, and, uh, into the show notes, as well as links to all, a bunch of the articles that we've referenced throughout this conversation. Oh, thank you. So, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Mark. No problem. So, yeah, Mary, thanks so much for the conversation. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, it's been really interesting to chat with you. So thanks for your thank time. You. And now the post-pod discussion with Dee and Mark. Awesome. Well, V, um, I know you weren't in the conversation, but um, I'm super interested to hear what you had to say or what you'd think about the interview with Mary. It was Well, first of all, it's a topic that is top of mind on so many different areas, especially brand equity. What does brand actually mean and, and whatnot? And yeah. there were a lot of nuggets that I took away when I was listening to the podcast. And I'm not going to lie, I actually listened to it probably three or four times uh, just because mm-hmm. I make sure I captured everything. But the one thing that really resonated as I as I listened to your conversation with uh, with Mary there was like talking about the brand secret sauce, so the brand power secret sauce, and she identified three elements: one, brand needs to be meaningful; second, it was uh, being different; and third, being salient. Mm-hmm. A little bit later, though, in the conversation, we also you you also talked about the the importance that brands need to be focusing on two key elements, which is customer centricity and imagination. Mm-hmm. And I think like, mm-hmm. even though they became, they came at two different points of the podcast, there were actually things that worked together because she shared two stats mm-hmm. that were fascinating because she said the consumer centricity, um, if you're doing that successfully, 68% of the brands that do that actually outpace the marketplace. But mm-hmm. if you add imagination to that as well, all of a sudden the same brands or companies are actually outpacing the marketplace by 87%. So you think about the secret Mm -hmm. sauce of being meaningful, different and salient while having being consumer centric and imaginative. I think that's the secret of actually creating longevity in a brand, but also being prominent in the the mind space that you occupy for consumers. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I mean, to me, kind of the consumer centricity part relates back to that insights before uh, tactics idea, where I think it does matter that you you think and examine the market first before you start doing stuff, because anybody could do stuff, but if it's not relevant to the market and it's not unique or differentiated in some way, then it just becomes kind of like whitewashing like everybody's doing it and we're all going to be purpose-led and we're all going to like be customer centric and just you know marketers being marketers and slapping labels on stuff and how often do we hear even in our 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 day-to-day operation if you will everyone's a strategist but you're a strategist without true insights and at times Mm -hmm. you look at historical data i think you and i we, we we worked with a gentleman that you know i remember he would say um, you can't drive a company forward if you're constantly looking in the rearview mirror. But if you're mm-hmm. basing your your uh, I guess your next steps, if you're basing your your new strategies on old data, how does that even work? So how often are you refreshing yeah. those insights to drive that strategy moving forward? And how much do you actually look at yeah. historical relevant uh, data to inform the future? It's pretty. Yeah. It's it's difficult to do. Totally. And I think that's an interesting point too, because that's in part where imagination comes in. Like, cause you, you know, like a classic Wayne Gretzky quote, uh, you skate to where the puck is going to be. Right. So that involves some form of imagination. Cause how do you know, like based on what you're looking at in the rearview mirror, like how do you know where to skate to, unless you start becoming imaginative and trying to predict where customers are going to go or, or where the market is going and where you need to go as a consequence of that. Um, yeah, I think that was super interesting. Man, that just brought on another thought. And it, it may be a topic for another day, unfortunately. <laughs> but it's like how much, how much insights, how much data is too much data that we start losing the imagination oh. that we need, right? As marketers. Totally. Totally. Well, I always think data is so dumb on its own. Like it literally is dumb. There's no value in data until you pull insights out of it. Then it has value. But like, I mean, you could stockpile data and it doesn't do anybody any good there's graveyards full of terabytes of data just sitting in people's computers and desks and stuff just waiting Uh, to be mined or dug up yeah the one thing i thought was uh super interesting i mean not that there's so many things that mary said that were great um and i really like some of the work that Cantar is doing it's really you like unique in their positioning um, but the, the way that she said, talks about customers and, and being customer centric and understanding that customers are adulterers. And I don't mean that in a negative derogatory way, but they're polygamous, uh, towards brands. They, you know, we all kind of think about customers as being these loyal creatures and we ourselves as marketers or business people aren't even loyal creatures you know, like, so it's funny that we have this perception of what customers are going to be, but then we ourselves contradict that. I absolutely love that quote um, because I think it's, we forget that we think loyalty is there indefinitely, but it isn't, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, you have to win that at every turn. You want to put it into marketing context. You have to win at it at every point of the consumer decision journey. It's one of those things I think we often forget. And we, when we look at either it from a positioning perspective and whatnot, that loyalty is just going to carry you through. It, mm-hmm. it may not. There could be another brand, another company that comes out of nowhere. Yeah. Do you think it's, do you think it's winning at every point or is it that you just don't make it hard at every point? I love that. Yeah. Reduce the friction. Yes. I completely agree. Maybe it's not winning at every point, but there's a consistency they're, they're almost the same thing but like slightly different nuance right like no that's a great point yeah hmm. it's fact. and the other one that we were just chatting about that it, um, before we started recording was that i thought the the nest the brand nest idea was so cool that she talked about because it's such a cool visual like yeah i could see these like we have robins that build nests in their backyard all the time and every spring they're just causing havoc in our backyard but they're gonna build a nest one way or another yeah, But I love that idea of like part of the job of the brand manager is to give the pieces of the nest to customers because so they can build with your stuff intentionally. Or the uh, fact that it's, it's built. Yeah, but it's also built with whatever they have. Sometimes I think right. maybe when, when we like a bird's nest is literally what can they find laying around that can 
really put up that south wall on that nest, right? It's not mm-hmm. like super specific. I think sometimes as marketers, do we overinvest and make sure that we have the right things constantly? And sometimes it's just, you just have to piece it together. And it's mm-hmm. it's not going to be perfect, but that's okay. It helps mm-hmm. breed some of that consistency that we're talking about. And you guys, mm-hmm. you you went into some some detail, and I'll I'll be completely transparent and honest here. I had never heard of the the analogy that I'm in, that Amazon uses on, on two different cases. So one was like uh, at, at every meeting, what they're making decisions around uh, any strategic decisions mm-hmm. that affect the consumer, that they place an empty chair in the middle to kind of represent what would the consumer think. And I thought that was yeah. fascinating because. First of all, I hadn't heard about it, but it really goes back to what you and Mary were talking about is how do you make sure that the guest is at the center of everything that you think strategically to mm-hmm. do? Yeah, it's a, it's such an like obvious way to put, you know, to empathize with the customer because often you have like a persona maybe that is brought up and whether it's right or wrong, who knows, but I mean, otherwise you're just looking at a lot of times spreadsheets and thinking about like, where's revenue coming from and like, how are we going to turn this into like a higher uh, average transaction value or longer customer lifetime value, but you don't really think about the person as a whole. So that idea of bringing a chair uh, as an empty chair to represent the customer, it's, it's kind of an interesting, it's a very like tangible way to bring in a customer that's a great way of putting it it is tangible because even symbolically having that chair there representing the consumer it forces Mm -hmm. you to think wait wait a second does the consumer actually care what Mm -hmm. what will they actually see um Mm -hmm. and then you also touched on again another thing i hadn't heard about so again completely transparent but it was like (laughs) being able to feed uh, a team of with two pizzas, making sure you have the mm-hmm. right people in the room. And it, again, how often, Mark, have you been in a room that you have 13, 15, 20 different individuals and it's a strategy session and you can't get anything out of anybody? Mm-hmm. Yeah, everyone's quiet. Everyone's quiet. Nobody says anything. Yeah. <laughs> and then later you get like to the approval process and they're all like, no, who approved this? <laughs> there's, there's all these things. wrong. <laughs> you're like, we just had all these meetings. <laughs> what? <laughs> Where were these ideas before? <laughs> exactly. But if you yeah. can feed the p- individuals in the room with two pizzas, that makes it a lot more tangible to say who needs to be in the room that can actually make a difference yeah. in what problem we're trying yeah. to solve today. Um, even though one could argue that you and I could probably eat two individual pizzas. Yeah, I could eat pizza for sure. <laughs> so it's extra large. Exactly. So, I mean, <laughs> yeah. but the premise. Yeah, not on a hungry day, not on a day where after we just did a big bike ride or something. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Not yeah. after our grand fondo. Yeah, like snack, like a happy hour <laughs> snack kind of moment. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, that was a really interesting one too. And I, I kind of going back to your point about the end of, imagination part and innovation too but i i do think you i mean there is a certain threshold of a team size or or group size before you get a lot of group think and then a lot of um silence because they just want the thing to get over um yeah i think that's an interesting way to kind of stimulate some of that inspiration and some of that imagination as well so just to tie it all back, I think you're right. You're, talk, you're talking about imagination. We're talking about consumer centricity and being honest with ourselves as well as marketers. Like, are we genuinely being consumer centric? But then looking at those other three elements of, you know, the, the, the brand power secret sauce, uh, as Mary put it, being meaningful, being different, and then being salient. Like, I think those things combined is what we, we as marketers should be striving for in our respective disciplines um to create that longevity the stickiness call it what you want um for and relevance potential for consumers Mm -hmm. yeah i I mean overall it was just so much fun chatting with her and i'm I'm really glad i I wish you i you know there's lots of (laughs) reasons why this will happen uh in the future i'm sure but we won't be able to do everyone together but yeah she was she's great I, i really enjoyed listening to her point of view on things and um, appreciate where she's trying to push and, and Kantar is trying to push uh, the future of brands and marketing and 
considering things like brand equity and how important that is. I think it's, it's a really great way of um, adding to the marketing conversation for sure. Completely agree. It was unfortunate I was missed it, but you know, the content there is, is gold and uh, I appreciated everything that Mary brought to, brought to the conversation. And I think it's, it's a lot of, a lot of information that our listeners can take from. So again, a great pod, um, especially being the first one that we're launching, which is exciting more to come obviously, but we'd love to hear everyone else's uh, opinions and please share in the comment section below what your thoughts were, uh, what your takeaways were and what you feel you can actually apply in day to day. Mark. Yeah, that's great. I'd, I'd love to see what other people think and, and what they, they learned from this and learn from any of the things. So I would also say if you've got any guests you'd like us to uh, try and invite, or if you've got any other topics you want us to explore, then by all means, leave them in the comments and we'll um, yeah, it'd be great to include you guys in, in the conversation. Thanks again, V. 